Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening for those uh, joining us for webinar three um, of the best uh, best uh, publishing practices. Uh, my name is Nargiza Ludgate and I am from the University of Florida. I'm very delighted to welcome you again um, and to present uh, webinar three uh, dedicated to publishing best practices. This uh, series are presented by the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Livestock Systems at the University of Florida and the University of Florida Libraries. Today's webinar is called Being Transparent, Principles of Transparency in Scholarly Publication. In this session, we will discuss best practices in publishing research, highlighting the usefulness of discipline-specific reporting standards to facilitate scholarly publishing and also making it available to li larger audiences. Next slide, please. I will now introduce our speaker, Dr. Terry Keith Self, uh, who is an experienced clinical investigator with specific expertise in the planning and execution of clinical trials involving mind-body therapies for chronic conditions related to aging and stress. She re received a Doctor of Chiropractic degree from Palmer College of Chiropractic and a PhD in Educational Research from the University of Virginia. She also completed an NIH-funded postdoctoral fellowship in clinical research at the University of Virginia Center for Study of Complementary and Alternative Therapies. Dr. Self's uh, research background serves her well in her current position as the Translational Research and Impact Librarian at the University of Florida. Before we start, uh, let me share a few housekeeping points for today's webinar. This webinar will go for about an hour. Uh, please keep your microphones mute during Dr. Sell's presentation. Uh, write your name, uh, position, um, your institution, and your email in the chat box if you like. The, all the recordings of this webinar and uh, the six other webinars in this series will be soon available uh, on the Livestock Labs uh, website. Um, I will shortly drop the link in the chat box. Um, uh, we also have all of the presentation is in English. We do have uh, presentation slides in French, and I will drop them momentarily. You can also open the ca caption note and select French to follow this presentation. Um, so I am enabling that. At the end of uh, Dr. Sell's presentation, we will have a short uh, question and answer session. Therefore, if you have any questions, please drop them in the chat and we will address them at the very end. Now I would like to give it to Dr. Self to walk us through this uh, webinar. Thank you. Thank you. So in this session, uh, our focus is going to be on transparency in scholarly publishing. Some of the topics that we'll cover include disclosing author contributions, competing interests, and whether the data are available. And then we'll move on to uh, talking about reporting the findings of research studies in a complete manner. I'm gonna go ahead and turn my camera off as I move through the slides. If you've uh, attended any of the previous sessions, um, some of this will be familiar. I just want to uh, revisit some of this briefly in case this is uh, someone's first session. We first encountered the Principles of Transparency and Best Practice in Scholarly Publishing in Session 1. If you were there, uh, you'll recall that four organizations in the scholarly publishing field 
got together and um, identified best practices and set forth 16 areas that journals seeking membership into any of their organizations uh, would be evaluated on. And those organizations included the Committee on Publication Ethics, the Directory of Open Access Journals, the Open Access Scholarly Publishers Association, and the World Association of Medical Editors. Today, we'll be talking about these COPE principles with an emphasis on transparency. Another resource mentioned uh, in a previous session is the World Conferences on Research Integrity Foundation. Some of their guidance also addresses transparency. They specifically mention uh, transparency about competing interests and honest reporting as responsible research practices and list incomplete reporting as well as inappropriate assignment of authorship as examples of detrimental or harmful research practices. And I call these out uh, because these detrimental practices reflect a lack of transparency. At the second World Conference on Research Integrity, they produced a set of guidelines known as the Singapore Statement. And we'll be looking at those guidelines uh, again with an eye to the things that apply to transparency. We'll start with the responsibilities regarding authorship. We covered the authorship issue in depth <laughs> in our last session. So this is just going to be a quick recap, again, emphasizing transparency. Um, so the Singapore statement states that researchers should list all authors meeting authorship criteria and acknowledge the names and roles of those who made significant contributions to the research, but did not meet all of the authorship criteria. And both of these recommendations promote open disclosure regarding authorship and contributorship, and that enhances transparency. The COPE principles also address authorship. They require journals to have policies on authorship and contributorship. And here I've included the Journal of Dairy Sciences policy on authorship as an example. This journal instructs authors to follow the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors guidelines regarding authorship. This should sound familiar <laughs> to anyone who attended the last session. Uh, in their instructions, they, they show the four criteria on which authorship should be based, stating that authors must meet, excuse me, all four of those criteria and that contributors meeting fewer than the four criteria should be listed in an acknowledgement section. Uh, 
Another example is from the journal Livestock Science. Their policy specifies that each author's contributions be described using the contributor roles taxonomy or credit. The requirement for this more detailed information about the, the actual roles played enhances the transparency of the authorship reporting. And again, if you want more information about the authorship criteria or the credit roles that was covered in depth uh, in session two. Now we move on to the single her statement requirement that researchers disclose any potential conflicts of interest that could compromise the trustworthiness of their work. And this speaks directly to transparency. COPE requires that journals have policies on how this information is disclosed. Again, uh, we've got an example of the policy from the Journal of Dairy Science. And they require that all sources of funding be named in the acknowledgements section of the paper. Funders' names and locations need to be provided and grant numbers may be included as well. Here is the example from Livestock Science. And I want to point out that Livestock Science is an Elsevier journal. Elsevier is a large publisher. So this same policy applies to many journals. So Elsevier requires all authors to disclose any interests that could potentially bias the work. And they, they, uh, include things that need to be in, in, uh, need to be disclosed. And these include not only support for the, the reported work, but also financial interest or professional relationships not directly related to the manuscript being submitted. So things such as consulting or speaking fees, travel reimbursement, grants, employment, or stock ownership, uh, any of those things within the last three years. And they also say anything else that authors think might warrant disclosure. If you've ever had to complete a conflict of interest disclosure form for your institutional research office, these things will look familiar to you. Same, same types of items that need to be reported. I've also included uh, links to a couple of resources that you might find useful. Elsevier has a, a guide to, <clears throat> to declaration of competing interests that you might find helpful. And the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors also has some guidance that might be useful. They give examples of sources of support that could pose potential conflicts and therefore should be disclosed. They also state that sponsor roles in the research or any restrictions that they place on reporting the findings be disclosed. The ICMJE uh, actually provides a form 
that can be used to address all of the required disclosures. Some journals actually use this specific form. Others have their own forms they want you to use. Always check the policy of the journal to which you're submitting your manuscript uh, and follow their specific instructions regarding disclosure. The next point I want to cover is data sharing. Uh, the Singapore Statement says that researchers have a responsibility to share data and findings openly. And COPE requires that journals have policies on data sharing. The Journal of Dairy Science policy is shown here, and they allow for data files to be linked uh, to the manuscript as supplemental files. And Livestock Science encourages authors to share their data where appropriate. And like the, the previous example, they allow the data to be linked. They also go on to encourage the authors to include a data statement regarding the availability of their data and point out that this might actually be required by their funder. And here's an example uh, of a funder that now requires a data management and sharing plan as part of their grant applications. This is from the, uh, the US uh, National Institutes of Health. So this policy requires a plan for how the data will be shared and preserved and encourages practices consistent with the FAIR data principles. As you can see, uh, this policy is relatively new. It became effective earlier this year. I don't know whether un other funders uh, will be enacting similar policies or not. Uh, and if so, when that might occur. If it turns out you are interested in more information on the FAIR data principles uh, mentioned by the NIH, I suggest this uh, as a, a good resource, a, a good place to start. And I also uh, wanted to mentioned that NIH has a useful list of characteristics to look for if you're needing to find a data repository. Again, I've, I've linked this page as well. So now we're going to move on to the need for researchers to report their findings fully and objectively. The more completely the study is reported, the more transparent it is. The use of reporting standards is extremely helpful here. Uh, again, as mentioned in session one, uh, reporting standards are guidelines that have been compiled by experts that identify the items that should be included in research articles. They were developed to improve the quality and completeness of research reporting. Many of the items they say need to be included address potential sources of bias that are specific to the study type. There are hundreds of reporting guidelines available. 
The Equator Network is the largest resource for finding the, the guidelines. There's also a site for animal-focused guidelines called Meridian. And I have linked to both on this slide and, and you'll see these come up again uh, in later slides. You should also look at the journal requirements on the use of reporting guidelines. Livestock science specifies that animal experiments should comply with the ARRIVE reporting guidelines. Uh, ARRIVE stands for Animal Research Reporting of In Vivo Experiments. And that's the guideline they specify. The Journal of Dairy Science, as another example, uh, their instructions to authors say a completed reporting guideline checklist must accompany the manuscript, but they don't specify the guideline to be used. They just say it should be an appropriate guideline uh, and provide a link that gives more information on relevant checklists. Here, they link to some specific guidelines and also the, the Meridian site previously mentioned. So Meridian, again, has guidelines specific for reporting studies involving animals. If you know the guideline you want, you can click on it from this page. And if you want more information on the checklists, try uh, the uh, try our tools for all checklist link. Here they provide a brief blurb about each of the guidelines uh, that can help you find which one best suits your needs. Uh, they have arrived as we've already mentioned, consort for randomized trials, PRISMA, uh, if you were doing a systematic review and meta-analysis, REFLECT is the, the guideline for livestock trials and STROBE VET for the veterinary extension of the, of the STROBE um, standard for observational studies in epidemiology. And the other uh, resource I mentioned was the Equator Network, which covers a much wider variety of study types. They currently have over 500 reporting guidelines here. Like Meridian, uh, they list Consort, Strobe, Prisma, and Arrive here. Uh, and they also have a search function that you can use um, to help you find other relevant reporting standards, for example, I just um, typed in the word livestock as free text to see what reporting standards come up. And that resulted in two reporting guidelines. Uh, the first one being reflect, which is the guideline for randomized control trials for livestock and food safety. That link takes me to a record for that guideline that has links to full text 
resources uh, such as the 22 item checklist itself, which is available as a Word document or as a PDF. And scrolling down <laughs> this record um, shows they also have a, a paper that goes into more detail about the items on the checklist. Um, it explains why, why the art items are included and it gives examples. They also, for this particular standard, um, have a link to the checklist in French and one in Spanish. And here is the reflect checklist. You can see it includes items on um, what should be reported in the title and abstract of the paper, what should be included in the introduction and then multiple items covering the methods section of the paper. The more transparently the methods are described, the easier it is for readers to make a judgment about how much confidence they have in the results of the study. And the results section should include information on the flow of participants through the study, information on the baseline demographic and clinical characteristics for each group, the numbers included in each analysis, results for each primary and secondary outcome, not just selected outcomes. Any additional analyses that were performed and all adverse events that occurred. In the discussion section, Findings should be interpreted and put in the context of the existing literature and their generalizability should be discussed. Sources of potential bias or imprecision should also be taken into account. And then here we're looking at um, just one little piece of the explanation and elaboration article where they give each checklist item along with an example of how you might report that item and an explanation of why it's important to address that item in your article. In this example on blinding or masking, um, they define what they mean by the term. They explain that it's associated with internal validity of the study and that it can be implemented in most randomized controlled trials. They go on to point out that even though it, it should be possible to implement, <laughs> uh, it is poorly reported in livestock trials. 
And they cite some studies indicating that trials that fail to report blinding were more likely to report favorable outcomes or larger treatment effects uh, compared to trials that did report blinding. So I think for most people, if this is your field of research, as you're looking at the checklist items, you can clearly see how the various items, um, reporting those is, is enhancing the transparency of the research. And like I say, um, even if it's not clearly apparent to you from the checklist itself, you can always look at the explanation and elaboration article that will help you to understand how this reporting aids transparency. And I've left plenty of time um, if we want to address any of the particular items in the, the checklist, we can come back to this or any of the other slides. So in this session, um, we discussed the need to report authorship contributions, declare competing interests, share data when appropriate, and completely and transparently report your research findings. We looked at one example of a reporting standard that can be useful in promoting complete reporting. And I showed you where you can find other reporting standards. I've also uh, included links to uh, relevant resources on this final resources slide uh, in addition to all of the, the links that were provided throughout. And Nargiza, um, we've got plenty of time for Q&A. Excellent. Um, excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Terry. I think we have a few questions. Let me go through. Okay, there is one from uh, Michel Dion from Ilri. Mm -hmm. uh, he says, often we do not have the same references standards among partners for publishing. For example, at Ilri, we have a list of references references journal uh, we are advised to use. However, partners may have different standards and objectives. Often we do not want to delay partners because they may need to publish to advance in uh, their job. Um, it is always a difficult trade-off. What do you think about this? What will be your recommendations in situations like this, uh, Terry, if you could elaborate? Um, sure. Um... I think <laughs> what's being asked um, is about like specific institutional requirements about journals in which to publish. Is that, am I understanding that correctly? That, that some partners are at institutions that that want you to be publishing in a certain set of places, whereas a, another partner is being advised like a different set of journals that they need to be publishing in and, and how to navigate that. Is that the yes. issue? Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Um, so that's like those sets of recommendations are different than the sets of recommendations that I was talking about. So let me let me try to address the question and um, elaborate on the recommendations that I was talking about. So yeah, the, the issue with I need to publish here and co-authors need to publish there. Um, I don't really have any good advice on that. That's just something that you're going to need to negotiate uh, among the partners. Uh, and as you alluded to, um, sometimes, sometimes a, a publication is a more pressing issue for one of the authors, maybe then for some of the others, um, in which case you might lean toward trying to let them do what they need to do. <laughs> um, that's just going to be part of part of collaborating with researchers from other institutions. Um, in in either case, what whatever journal you decide is the most appropriate to be publishing the article in. That's where the, the things that I was talking about, the recommendations, um, those come into play. You'll look, once you've, <laughs> once you've made that decision, um, had that conversation, and you might actually, it might be something to look at when you are deliberating on, okay, which journal are we going to publish in? Um, we need to look at, at what are the requirements of the institutions for each author, but also look at the, the journals and look at what the journal is requiring as far as reporting standards um, as, as far as what information needs to be disclosed, as far as what actually constitutes authorship for that journal and how that needs to be reported. Um, in case any of those factors need to be weighed when you're choosing a journal in which to publish that is going to meet the needs of as many of your partners as possible. Um, and of course, then there's the whole conversation about finding the journal, uh, not only that that is meeting your needs as, as a researcher at your particular institution, but the whole idea of doing this research and publishing it is to get it seen by the people in your field that it makes a difference to. So choosing the journal with an eye to who is going to be reached by that journal, um, which ideally would take precedence over what kind of um, suggestions 
the the institution is suggesting as far as journals in which to publish. Um, but in reality, that's all of those factors come into play. I think many times those recommendations from institutions are aimed at making sure that their researchers are not publishing in predatory journals. And we're going to be going into that topic in depth in our next session. So we may circle back around to this discussion then. Thank you, Terry. Um, I do not see any other questions. So I would like to invite the participants to unmute if they have a question or would like to make a comment to ask a question. You're welcome to unmute and ask your question. Um, perhaps I can ask a question. Yeah. Oh, please go ahead. Oh, can we? Okay, it's it's related to to my question eh, that what I have written. So, yeah, we 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 often have these problems. Um, um, you 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 may not want to to hold a partner of publishing, but you know that you don't want to publish with him in that journal. So sometimes it's very difficult because if a partner does not care much about. Um, the quality of that journal or, or the principles of that journal, but they want to go ahead. But you, as um, the PI or at another level, you uh, you know that it's not all good for your your own profile. And sometimes it's hard also to tell a partner to stop. It will just break the the I mean the incentive or whatever. So that's why I ask this question. So. We are facing many of these. For example, I had um, a partner who just went to draft three papers and submit them without uh, a lot of rigor. So, and because he wanted to have papers published for his uh, something at the university to advance, so it was very difficult to 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 say something. So, yeah. Maybe not on this during this this topic. Maybe we'll have chance to discuss that in another topic. Maybe something like that. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Thanks for thanks for clarifying the the issue. Um, so that that raises lots of thoughts <laughs> in my head. So one is the issue around. And something that we discussed in the previous session, which was on authorship. So any, any of the authors um, need to be following like the authorship criteria. So for one thing, if they're if they're authoring something, they need to be consulting with all of the other authors, making sure. And let me. I'm going to go flipping back through slides, so hopefully I won't make anybody dizzy here. Where. Is it? It was about the authorship criteria. So partners shouldn't just be taking it upon themselves to write a paper, decide where it's going to be published. Um, 
anyone that was involved in the research uh, that made a substantial contribution should be consulted about any publications and they should be given the opportunity to be involved in drafting the work and giving final approval of the version that's going to be published, which would of course include final approval on the journal in which it's going to be published. So I understand it's problematic. Um, one suggestion is having these kinds of, of guidelines in place when you're having those difficult conversations, you might be able to keep the the conversation on an objective um, an objective plane without people's emotions <laughs> uh, getting involved by basing the conversation around these established guidelines that exist um, and and presenting it as we need to make sure we are following these guidelines. So it's not that I as a co-author am requiring this they're taking issue with this. This is a policy um, that reputable journals are follow following. And because of that, we need to make sure that we are following this policy. Um, I do think that that being able to like have concrete guidelines that exist and are recognized makes it easier to have those conversations and, <laughs> and have a productive outcome. Thank you, Derry. <clears throat> I would like to invite other questions. If there are any, you are welcome to unmute and ask a question. Uh, Terry, while we're waiting for the questions, I was wondering, uh, there is a, a big push by donors uh, to, to disseminate research results and they emphasize on um, open access journals. What have been your experience with industry? Um, do they have the same push to have a wider dissemination of research results to different audiences? Or do you think they are still uh, control and uh, would like to target specific journals that uh, speak to the industry uh, partners uh, and um, uh, stakeholders? Frankly, I I haven't dealt much with um, with the industry side of things. Um, I will say, hmm, the open access model of publishing is a growing model. There is some thought that uh, making articles available for free, you know, open access um, to the public helps them be seen by more people. Um, I think there's some, like a relatively small body of research that points in that direction, but I think 
generally speaking, whoever's funding the research, um, whether it's public sector, private sector, they, they want that research to be disseminated broadly. Um, and as a researcher, <laughs> you want people to know uh, about the work that you're doing. And if you're in an academic environment where publish or perish is a thing, um, generally the, the most common metrics that people are looking at in regard to publications, in addition to number of publications, um, are things around how frequently your article is cited by others. And that opens up the whole issue of then, you know, if, if you want your article to be cited, then it needs to be reaching your audience, which are the people who will be citing you in the future uh, and brings us back to the importance of choosing journals that, that are indexed in places where your audience is going to come across them. Um, so knowing what databases your audience searches when they're trying to find information and making sure that the journal that you're publishing your article in appears in those databases um, is going to, uh, I would think, satisfy everyone. It, it helps you as the researcher because it helps people see your work. It helps you get cited, which is a metric that's going to be important in your academic career. And um, it means that the a large number of people and maybe more importantly, the right people are seeing the research that that your funder um, has as, as something that is important on their end as well. Thank you, Terry. We still have a few minutes. If you have uh, questions, you can either drop them in the chat and we will address them or uh, you are welcome to unmute and ask a question. Uh, Terry, is there any slide you would like to go back and maybe give um, facilitate a little bit more discussion on the content, uh, given that you wanted to leave more time for uh, for participants to ask the question. We have about five minutes. Yeah, the, the one, um, the area I was thinking of in particular that people might have opinions <laughs> about and want to discuss um, had to do with the checklist. Uh, the, the reporting standard and and the items that they are saying it is important to be covered in any articles um, in this case reporting the results of randomized controlled trials in livestock and food safety. As I say, I think 
anyone, if this is your field of research, um, I think reading through these items, it's fairly self-evident why it would be important to include these things. Um, and if anyone had comments about any of these, If, and also, if these are things, um, as I mentioned in one of the, the slides, that, for example, the thing about blinding, it's it should be doable, uh, but it turns out that, what did they say? Only four of 100 randomly selected livestock trials with health or production outcomes uh, reported on this. So that does not mean that they didn't blind, uh, like that, that blinding was not part of the study. It just means they didn't report on it. And if you didn't report on it, Readers cannot assume that you did it. Uh, so one thing I, I should stress is, for one thing, if you're doing all of these things, make sure you're reporting on them so you're getting credit for the rigor of the study that you're doing. Um, don't make assumptions that, well, obviously, we did that because that everybody does that. That's just best practice. It's not necessarily being done. Um, and the only way that the readers of your article are going to know that you did it is if you make a point of reporting on that fact. And the, the flip side is... Um, to think about as you're looking at these, are, are there any of these that you have noticed are lacking in research papers that you're reading and, and that you are struggling with because, you know, I read this paper, but I don't know, I don't know whether to trust it or not because they, they neglected to report so much, I can't tell if this was a well-done study or not. So from, from either end, um, things that, that you realize you need to be reporting, things you wish others were doing a better job of reporting, all in, in the name of just being transparent about how the study was conducted. Thank you, Terry. Um, I think we will need to wrap up here. I would like on behalf of the Livestock Lab and the participants, thank you for this uh, interesting topic and uh, information that you shared. Um, I would like to remind our participants that our next webinar is on November 17th and it will be about uh, being accessible. Uh, is open access publishing right for you? The, the session will be about the pros and cons of open access publishing. Um, and um, uh, Dr. Self will share with us uh, the resources that can help you decide uh, whether an open access publishing is uh, a viable option for you. Um, I share the flyer for uh, this webinar series. Um, uh, we hope uh, you could um, encourage your colleagues and your students to come to these webinars. And uh, hopefully very soon, uh, all three webinar series and uh, the following three webinar series will be available on the Livestock Labs uh, uh, webpage. And you can uh, listen to the recording, share those with your colleagues, your students, as well as uh, access PowerPoint presentations, both in English and in French. Thank you for coming and we look forward to seeing you in two weeks. Thank you.